This is the AV lecture for Lab 6. Today we're going to be discussing histology. And histology is the study of tissues. And tissues um, are made up of cells, which are the living component of tissues, as well as extracellular material, which are non-living um, components of tissues. And these could be uh, proteins or um, other structural materials. And tissues have a particular function, and when two or more tissues work together, they form an organ. And in, in this AV lecture, this is going to be broken up into two parts, and we're going to be discussing the four main types of tissue in the human body. Our four main tissues are epithelial tissue, nervous tissue, connective tissue, and muscular tissue. And in this part of the AV lecture, we're going to be focusing on epithelial and nervous tissue. And in this lab, we're going to be introducing this idea of structure, function, and location. And this is the overarching theme of the lab. And although we explicitly discuss it in lab six, this is going to be a very important concept to understand moving forward in this lab, as well as important in your careers. And basically what we're, what we're representing here is these three components are going to be intricately related. And each component is going to dictate the other two components. And just by slightly altering a component, one of these components, the, over the overall physiological function of something is going to be compromised. And to illustrate the importance and the relationship between structure, function, and location, I just want to perform a, a quick thought experiment. And what, we, what we're showing here is um, a very basic image of a car. And this car has, uh, you know, various, various parts, um, all of which serve a particular function, and these parts have particular structures, um, which then in turn dictate the location. And so, for example, we have a, a steering wheel, which is a circular, circular in structure, and the function is to turn, turn the wheels. And we need this steering wheel to be um, in, the, in the cab of the vehicle so that a person can st steer that steering wheel, turn that steering wheel. And that steering wheel is going to be connected to the axles, which in turn steer or turn the wheels when we turn the, turn the steering wheel. We also have wheels, which are indicated by these black circles down here. And those are going to have a similar um, structure. They're going to be circular, similar to the steering wheel. But they serve a completely different function. The function is to turn and spin, and that spin grips the road, and that then pulls the car or pushes the car forward. And so the location of these of the wheels or the tires needs to be underneath the car so that, that they can come in contact with the road um, and spin as the axle spins. Now let's say, let's imagine that we switch the location of all these parts. Let's say we have steering wheels where the tires used to be and tires where the steering wheel used to be. Will this car function properly anymore? It will not, unequivocally. The, although we have two, two parts of the vehicle that are similar in structure, they serve a completely different function, and therefore they have a particular location for that function to occur. And so just by switching the location of these similar parts of the vehicle, it totally compromises the overall function of this vehicle. And this idea is essential to anatomy and physiology. We're going to, um, today we're going to introduce tissues and each tissue is going to be 
made up of cells of a particular structure and they're going to these tissues are going to serve a particular function and that function is going to be essential to a certain location and it's going to be unique to a certain location and so all three of these components are going to be dictating each other and just by altering slightly some of these components the overall physiological function of a tissue is going to be compromised similarly to just changing some some things with our vehicle thought experiment here now let's move into epithelial tissue epithelial tissue is going to be composed of one or more layers of of closely adhering cells and this is going to be um, mostly made up of living cellular material. Um, and so we say that this has a high cellular to low matrix ratio. And that just means that for any, any epithelial tissue, it's going to be mostly comprised of cells, and we're going to have low um, non-living material, such as other proteins um, and other uh, structural materials within the tissue. An epithelial tissue um, is, a, is a tissue that covers or lines a certain part of the body and it forms a flat sheet within the apical or the upper surface exposed to the environment or the internal body cavity. Epithelial tissue, um, because it's densely packed with cells, there are really no, there's no more room for blood vessels. And so to receive nutrients, to receive oxygen, this needs to come from the underlying connective tissue. Epithelial cells are typically going to be connected to the basal surface or the basement membrane. And the basement membrane is um, non-cellular. It's not living. Um, this is a, mainly a structural uh, component to the tissue that allows those cells to connect. And there are two, two surfaces of um, tissues. Um, we, we briefly discussed the basal surface that you can think of that as um, the quote bottom part of the cells or the tissue. And then we have the apical surface which is indicated here and this is the quote top or the superficial portion of the cell or the tissue. And in general, the way that we're going to classify epithelial tissue is based on three components. One, the first part of the name is going to describe how many layers of the, t of the cells there are. The second component is going to describe the shape of the cells that make up the tissue. And then the third part is, we know that it's epithelial tissue, so we're going to have, um, we're always going to state that it's epithelial tissue. And in our lab, we're going to have three types of cells found within a, um, a epithelial tissue. And those are shown on, on the rows here. We've got squamous, which look like flat, squished cells cuboidal, which look like cube cells, and columnar, which look like columns. And then we're also going to have um, three types of layers here, and those are shown in the columns. We have simple, and this means that there is only one layer of cells. And we're also going to have stratified, and this means that we're going to have multiple layers of cells. Now there's this third type of, um, of layering here, and this is called pseudostratified, and that's shown down in the lower right corner there. And this, this pseudostratified, um, although it's, it sounds like it's stratified, the word pseudo, that prefix pseudo, means false. So although it appears to be stratified, it's really not. But because we want to be as specific um, as possible. We call this pseudo-stratified. If we compare simple versus stratified epithelium, 
Simple again just contains one layer of cells as shown here. And we're going to name that tissue just based on the cells that are in that one layer. It's pretty straightforward. For stratified epithelium, this tissue again contains more than one layers. And so the question becomes which layer do we use to describe the cell in the name? And well, if you recall, we have these, these two surfaces. We have the basal surface and the apical surface. And the rule for naming tissues is that we're always going to use the apical surface to name these tissues. And as we go through these tissues, when we get to the stratified tissue types, remember this. Remember that we're using the apical surface or the, quote, top or superficial layer to name these tissues. So let's get into these epithelial tissues. The first that we'll discuss is simple squamous epithelium. The structure is a single row of flattened cells. You find this tissue in the lungs, specifically at the alveoli. Also inside the lining of the heart and blood vessels, kidney glomerulus, and kidney tubules. And the function of this tissue is for rapid diffusion of substances. Our next tissue is simple cuboidal epithelium. The structure is a single row of cube-shaped or wedge-shaped cells. The location is at the kidney tubules, uh, glands, and livers. And the function is absorption and secretion. Now this, this tissue is typically going to um, look like the images shown here. And anytime you see this this circular or cylindrical orientation of these cells, this is very indicative of simple cuboidal epithelium. And this is because these, these cells, this tissue, is going to form um, kidney tubules. And when we take a cross-section of those kidney tubules, what we have is, is this um, cylindrical, oblong, um, ellipsis, uh, uh, slide. And although this is absorption and, and secretion, um, which is similar to simple squamous epithelium, um, this, this tissue is going to be different because we're not going to be absorbing um, oxygen. We're not, it's not diffusion of oxygen. We're going to be pulling, pulling water um, or adding water to urea at the kidney tubules. And because of this, we need those cells to be a little bit thicker so that we can control that um, absorption and secretion more. Otherwise, if it was simple squamous at this location, uh, we, would, we wouldn't be able to control that absorption and secretion as readily. Next tissue is simple columnar epithelium. The structure of this tissue is a single row of tall, narrow cells that are vertically oriented and there will be a nuclei in the basal half of the cell so that um, the, par the portion of the cell on the closer to the basal surface. The location is at the stomach and the intestines and the uterine tubes and we also have absorption and secretion at, for this tissue. Um, and we have some other structures here as well. We have um, the goblet cell, which is indicated here. And goblet cells secrete mucus. And microvilli are on the apical portion of the cell. And the function of microvilli is to increase surface area of the apical surface of this tissue. And the reason for this is because this tissues found in the stomach and the intestines, um, we're going to be absorbing food, uh, excuse me, absorbing nutrients from our food um, with this tissue. And the, what the microvilli do is they essentially increase the surface area that, so that we have more area where we can pull nutrients out of the food as it passes through the intestines. Now a helpful trick for this tissue is that 
you notice on that image on the right, all the nuclei are roughly oriented in this linear fashion. Um, and this is going to be a key difference with our, uh, between our next tissue. Our next tissue is pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. As the name suggests, this appears stratified, but it really isn't. That's what pseudo means, that means false. So this is falsely stratified. And if we look closely on the image on the left, we notice that there's these extra cells there, the basal cells, but all the other cells do touch the basement membrane. So there really isn't any stratification going on here. All these cells touch the basement membrane. Uh, now the location of this tissue is going to be in the respiratory passages and the function is to secrete mucus and propel or trap dust particles and move them away from the lungs. Now it accomplishes uh, this function because this tissue has cilia on the apical surface and cilia you can think of as small hairs and you can imagine as you breathe in um, dust or smoke uh, these, these cilia, these, these hair cells, are going to actually trap that dust. And when the cilia trap the dust, we have goblet cells here that are going to secrete mucus. It's going to trap that dust so that we can expel um, these foreign objects from our, from our respiratory passages. Now, if we, were to, if we didn't have cilia, um, in our air passages, we would we would breathe in all sorts of dust and and foreign objects that we really don't want in our lungs at all. Um, and this is of particular concern for smokers because cigarette smoke actually destroys those cilia, destroys those hair cells over time. And without that cilia, you open up your body to um, all sorts of um, you're, you become very vulnerable to breathing in all sorts of dust and, dust and particles that you really don't want inside your body. Now we're going to move into stratified epithelia. And these tissues are going to be composed of more than one layers of cells. And recall from the introduction that we're always going to classify the uh, stratified tissue based on the apical surface, the apical cells. Now there's one exception to this, um, and that is the transitional epithelium, and we'll get into the details um, of that in a minute. The um, basal layers of these tissues are going to sit directly on the basement membrane, um, and as we'll see, there's going to be some variations in these uh, stratified epithelia. Um, in particular, we're going to have keratinized epithelium where the um, apical surface of the tissue is composed of dead cells. And we're also going to have non-keratinized epithelium where the apical layers um, are, are living cells, actually. Here we're showing keratinized stratified squamous. And the structure of this tissue is a multi-layered epithelium covered with a layer of compact dead squamous cells packed with the protein keratin. Um, and it, the apical cells have a flattened shape. The location is, to, uh, is on the epidermis, the epidermal layers of the skin, and the function is to prevent water loss, prevent penetrations of, of other organisms, such as bacteria or viruses. And it's also, uh, this tissue is going to be abrasion resistant. So if we rub up against something, um, that this tissue is going to be resistant to that stress. Now, um, this there there are a couple components to this tissue. Um, there's going to going to be a living section, which is going to be more deep in um, in our skin, and then um, as we've already mentioned, the superficial or the apical layers are going to be um, dead. These cells are going to be dead. Now, on the living portion of the epithelial cells, um, we're going to have two types, two specific types of cells here. We're going to have melanocytes and keratinocytes. We're going to focus mostly on keratinocytes in this AV lecture. 
And keratinocytes are going to um, be cells that produce keratin, this protein keratin. And keratin is found not only in our skin, but also our nails and our hair. It's a very tough, tough protein. And as these cells um, continue to regenerate through mitosis, they're going to be forced up towards the apical layers, towards the superficial layers, the epidermis. And as they become increasingly more superficial, the keratin within these keratinocytes um, becomes more, more pronounced, um, produced more, eventually to the point where these cells are um, completely filled with keratin and these cells are no longer living. And this, live, this um, non-living, dead, uh, squamous cell portion of the epidermis is extremely important um, to the function of this tissue because it acts as this protective buffer and it protects these deeper living tissue from infection um, if we were to scratch ourselves. The next tissue is non-keratinized stratified squamous. And this tissue is, a, is going to be multiple layers. It's stratified. The apical layers are going to be squamous cells. And as the name suggests, these cells are not keratinized. Uh, you find this tissue on the tongue, in the oral mucosa, the esophagus, and vagina. And the function is because it lacks this layer of dead um, cells at the top, um, this forms a moist, slippery layer um, that is still abrasion resistant. Now, um, uh, the key to this tissue is um, because it's non-keratinized, you will see nuclei within each cells throughout all the layers of the tissues. Um, so if you're having trouble um, on a practical quiz, just ask yourself, do I see nuclei throughout all these layers? If the answer is yes, you know that this tissue is non-keratinized. And if the answer is no, then you know that the tissue is keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Now, if we go back to this idea of structure, function, and location, um, we can see with, with these last two tissues, keratinized and non-keratinized stratified squamous, we can start to see why this relationship between structure, function, and location is so important to our understanding in this lab. And if you just think about um, switching these two tissues and the location of those tissues, what happens? So let's say that we have non-keratinized stratified squamous cells um, on our skin. What would that do? Well, this would be, this would be very... It would be very difficult to hold things because um, we'd have this slippery layer um, on our skin. And because um, non-keratinized stratified squamous um, is living tissue throughout the whole, or living cells throughout the whole tissue, um, we would likely lose more water. And we would also open ourselves up to infection anytime we touch something or got even a minor cut. Likewise, if we had keratinized stratified squamous cells um, inside of our mouth, we would um, effectively have perpetual cotton mouth. And this would be, this would be very difficult to, to eat because saliva would not break down the food. Um, and so, so just with these two tissues, we can start to see why um, this relationship between structure, function, and location um, is important and and how each of those components dictate each other. Our next tissue is transitional epithelium. The structure is a multi-layered epithelium with rounded surface or apical cells that flatten when the tissue becomes stretched. And this is important because it allows the cells to maintain shape um, at those apical or superficial layers. The location is the urinary tract, um, also the kidney, the ureter, as well as in the bladder. And the function is to stretch um, and allow the filling of the bladder, the ureter, the ur urinary tract. Let's do a quick recap 
of uh, our epithelial tissues here. Um, and we're just going to go through some images and we're going to try to identify these. So feel free to pause the video, first identify these images A through E, um, and then start the video again and, and see how you did. So this, this first one that we're looking at, um, image A, what do you think this tissue is? Well, let's, let's go through this. Um, and first, how many layers are there? There appears to be one layer. Um, what do the cells look like? Well, they appear to be cube-like. And we know that this is epithelial tissue, so um, the last bit will be epithelium. So if we put it all together, simple, because there's one layer. Cuboidal, because the cells are cube-like. And um, it, this is an epithelial tissue, so we have simple cuboidal epithelium. Let's look at image B. What tissue do we have here? Well, again, let's, let's walk through this step by step. How many layers? This appears to be stratified. Uh, what types of cells are on the apical surface? Uh, they appear to be uh, squamous. And this is an epithelial tissue. So again, we have epithelium for the last bit. But we have two types of stratified squamous epithelium. So is this non-keratinized or keratinized? Well, it appears that the nuclei are visible throughout um, all layers of this tissue. So that suggests that the cells are living. So this means that the, this is non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. We look at image C. We are um, focusing on the layer there um, that's indicated by the arrows. And if we walk through this again, just as the other two images, how many layers do we have? This is a single layer. What is the cell type? Well, it's a squamous cell. And we know it's epithelial, so epithelium. So this is simple squamous epithelium. If we look at image D, um, Let's walk through this again. How many layers do we have? It appears to be one layer, so that's simple. What do the cells look like? They look uh, like columns, so columnar. And uh, we know this is epithelial, so this is simple columnar epithelial tissue. And then the final image there is E. And we also have a... Um, a column-like cell, and this appears to be stratified, um, so that suggests that this is pseudo-stratified. And we see the cilia on the apical surface there, and this is again an epithelial tissue. So what we have is pseudo-stratified ciliated columnar epithelium for that last image there. Okay, our last tissue for this AV lecture is uh, the nervous tissue, and this is a pretty straightforward tissue. Uh, the structure is composed of neurons and glial cells, and the location is in the brain, spinal cord, ganglia, and peripheral nerves, and the function is uh, for sensory input, sensory integration, muscle control, mental activity. Basically, any time that we're going to um, receive stimuli, um, and transmit a, sing a signal to a different, from the brain to a different part of the body, um, nervous tissue is going to be involved. Uh, and this is, this is very straightforward. Um, this, this tissue stains a dark purple on the slides. Uh, the neuron is indicated there um, on that left image. And then those smaller, darker spots um, kind of outside the neuron. Those are our uh, glial cells. To end this AV lecture, I just wanted to go over this relationship between structure, function, and location again. This is the underlying theme of this lab, and um, this is not just a concept that we discuss in this lab only, but it's going to be um, a major component throughout the entire semester. And it's important to remember that the three of these components are going to dictate each other and they're going to interact 
And that interaction between these three components is going to um, result in some, some ending physiological function. And as we, as we highlighted with keratinized and non-keratinized stratified squamous, as soon as you start switching the location um, of these tissues, the whole um, function and the structure of those tissues no longer makes sense in that new location. Likewise, if you, if you change the structure, for example, if you take simple squamous epithelium and make it stratified squamous epithelium, the, the function of that is no longer going to be diffusion of oxygen because it won't be able to diffuse oxygen as readily. And so then the location of that new tissue starts to break down. And so it's important to consider how these three things interact. And as you're studying, don't be afraid to go through those thought experiments and say, okay, what happens if I slightly change the structure of this tissue? Or what happens if I put this tissue in a different location? And then ask yourself, does the function make sense anymore? And it probably won't. Um, and if you have this deeper understanding of, of the structure function location relationship of these tissues, you will start to see this pattern and this relationship later in lab. Now, I just wanted to um, end on uh, kind of the goals moving forward into your practical quiz. Um, before your practical quiz, you should be comfortable identifying tissues using microscopes and being able to provide a function, a location, and describe the structure associated with um, epithelial tissue and nervous tissue. And then when you're naming those tissues, remember that each tissue is named based on one, the number of layers. The second component is something about the cell, the shape of the cell. And then you do have to specify if it's epithelial tissue or nervous tissue.